Hi everyone, my name is Pastor Ryan Radke, and this is the midweek message for Messiah Lutheran Church in Mechanicsville, Virginia, for June 17th, 2020. I know that there have been different themes for these midweek messages, and I wanted to follow suit. So I had an idea. I would share a series of messages with you based on commemorations. Here's where the idea came from. Back when I was a kid going to church, I liked to look through the front pages of the hymnal um, when the rest of the service was over my head or boring. There was a page in the front that had the proper liturgical color for every church season and special festival listed on it. There were prayers. Um, each section had its own cool little graphic. I guess I was a church nerd even back then. Now, the red ELW hymnal, this one, that most ELCA churches use now, has all of that stuff in the front and more. Um, there is a lot more cool artwork. Look at that. The different seasons. Uh, there's even more prayers. And there's a whole section called the church year. You have the calendar that still has all the colors listed. Uh, you have the propers, which are the readings and the prayers of the day for every Sunday and major festival of the church year. You have lesser, lesser festivals for things like apostles and evangelists. And then you have the commemorations right there. Um, they're divided into eight categories. Saints, martyrs, missionaries, renewers of the church, renewers of society, pastors and bishops, theologians and teachers, and artists and scientists. Here's what the ELCA's worship team says about these commemorations. Throughout its history, the church has sought to lift up Christians who have been unique, exemplary people of faith. It is not that these people are perfect, as we are all both saint and sinner, yet their lives point to how God's extraordinary grace works in ordinary people. So I thought, I'll talk about the commemoration closest to Wednesday each week, and we can learn about the person or the people being honored and remembered that day and have their lives, their faith, inspire us. I'll share a scripture reading to go with it. And then I'll share a memory about myself, my own life, a co-memory with you. Get it? And you can get to know me a little better while we're still worshiping in cyberspace like this. So co-memorations, remembering stories of faith together from the saints, from myself, and hopefully I'll be learning some of your stories too in the weeks to come. That's the plan. And then I saw what the commemoration is for Wednesday, June 17th. Emmanuel Nine, martyrs, died 2015. Here's what it says about them. On June 17th, 2015, Clementa C. Pinckney, Cynthia Marie Graham Hurd, Susie Jackson, Ethel Lee Lance, DePayne Middleton Doctor, Tawanza Sanders, Daniel Lee Simmons, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, and Myra Thompson were murdered by a self-professed white supremacist while they were gathered for Bible study and prayer at the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, often referred to as Mother Emmanuel, in Charleston, South Carolina. Pastors Pinckney and Simmons were both graduates of the Lutheran Theological Seminary, Southern Seminary. A resolution to commemorate June 17th as a day of repentance for the martyrdom of the Emmanuel Nine was adopted by the Churchwide Assembly of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America on August 8th, 2019. Congregations of the ELCA are encouraged to reaffirm their commitment to repenting of the sins of racism and white supremacy which continue to plague this church, to venerate the martyrdom of the Emmanuel Nine, and to mark this day of penitence with study and prayer. I confess that my first thought was to not use this commemoration as my first one. It's not just the first of this series, it's my first one ever. I thought, don't get so heavy on your first one. Find a nice artist or missionary. But then I realized this isn't a coincidence. This is the world we're living in still right now, five years later. This commemoration isn't even in our hymnal, it's too new. But the sins at the root 
of this martyrdom, they aren't new. So let's talk. The passage of scripture that came to mind for me today was Acts 2, 41 to 47. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost after Peter finished his speech to the crowds. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. What this passage of Acts describes is church. It's God's people gathering together, devoting themselves to scripture, praying, breaking bread together, sharing and being generous, and giving thanks and praise to God. This is normal, basic, and it's joyful. That's what was happening at the Mother Emmanuel Church five years ago. People being the church together. Normal church stuff. They were gathered together, devoted to God's teachings in the word. They were sharing and praying. They were open to the visitor who joined them, not knowing that he and his family were members, at least on paper, of an ELCA congregation, not knowing the hatred in his heart. They were just being church together with glad and generous hearts. And I could share Lots of memories with you today about me doing normal church-related things, worship and fellowship and Bible study, sitting in church as a kid in the front of the hymnal, following along with the hymns, the, the smooth feel of the ribbons that we used as bookmarks in our old green hymnals, how it was my job to bookmark everything before our service started. I could share what it was like to attend Bible studies with my mom when I was a teenager and how it felt for my thoughts to be welcomed around the table with the adults in the room. But the memories I'll dedicate to the commemoration of the Emmanuel Nine are the two times I ever felt scared inside a church building. The first time wasn't even that scary in hindsight. It was back in 2009 at the church that my wife and I served as pastors at in Minnesota. A lot of people were angry, really angry about some of the things going on in the wider church. And we were the nearest receptacles for them to pour that anger into. I wasn't scared for my safety, although Pastor Liz did get cornered in her office once by a very large, very angry, very loud and threatening church member. But I was scared by the intensity of the emotions that came at us day after day in waves for weeks. The other time I was truly scared in a church was a few years later. I was the only one in the office area, probably in the whole building one afternoon. A young man came in, he was clearly agitated. I could just tell that something wasn't right, something was up. He wasn't clear on what was troubling him, but I kept talking in my calm voice and I listened to him when he talked. I asked questions and I made sure he knew I cared about his answers. I tried to help him calm down. We sat together on the floor at the end of the hallway and watched out the window down the street until he finally shared that he was actually there to keep an eye on one of the houses. And he was waiting for the police to show up and raid the house and he wanted to make sure he wasn't in it. I became very aware right then that no one else knew what was going on and that I was there alone with this man, this man who was distracted and agitated and who was misleading me and who was also scared and therefore unpredictable. Those are the only times I've ever felt genuinely scared in a church. And those times for me pale in comparison 
to what the people gathered together for study and prayer at Mother Emanuel five years ago must have felt. I have never been that scared, scared for my life. It has never crossed my mind that I might be targeted, harmed for being in church, for doing normal church things, for just being me. Even now, I don't think about that for, for doing normal church things. And that right there, that I've never been scared to just be myself, to just be doing the things I normally do, while so many people are scared every day for just being themselves, that highlights the divides, the pain, the anguish, the sins of racism that are at the fore in our country today. There's so much more that I could say about this that I should say, that I will say in the years to come in conversations and sermons in our own times of Bible study. And I will also not speak sometimes, but rather listen. Listen to the memories and stories and experiences of others who do know the fear that I have never come close to feeling. For now, there are two things I will close with. First, the converts in the story from Acts devoted themselves to the word of God and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. All of us who carry the name Christian must continue to devote ourselves to Jesus' teachings and example. We must devote ourselves to one another, to the life and well-being of all of God's children. And this devotion to Christ's words and deeds can't just be within the familiarity of our own church buildings or our fond memories. It's also out in the broken world where Christ is sorely needed. Second, the converts in the story from Acts felt awe at the wonders and signs that they saw the apostles performing. Do you know that some of the victims' families members and other church members from Mother Emmanuel went to visit the person who attacked him in jail and tell him that they had forgiven him? It doesn't erase the pain or horror or the anger that they felt. It doesn't mean that racism is solved. It doesn't mean that everyone touched by the violence of that day feels like forgiveness is an option. Forgiveness is a process, not a magic wand. But to me, even a small grain of forgiveness after something like that is a sign and a wonder and a source of awe. For what it's worth, June 17th is also our twins' 12th birthday. I want them to grow up and live in a world where they aren't afraid to do church things, where they aren't afraid for their neighbors' lives, where they or anyone else are afraid to just be themselves. My first instinct was to skip this commemoration, that it was too much for my first midweek message. But when we avoid the heavy stuff, the hard stuff, the tragic stuff, the world doesn't change. I want to help my kids build that acts world, that world where folks gather together to share and study and break bread and pray together. I wanna to help make the world better and I want to teach them to be agents of change too to make the kingdom of God a reality on earth in our limited way. So I will have tough and truthful conversations with my kids. I'll have tough and truthful conversations with you. I'll have tough and truthful conversations with God. I'll have tough and truthful conversations with folks whose memories and lives are different than mine. And I'll listen too. It so happens that the Virginia Synod is having a live Zoom meeting at 7 o'clock on the 17th, a day of remembrance and repentance for the Emmanuel Nine. I invite you to check out the Synod website for a link to join that meeting. I hope for all of you that you will experience awe and see signs and wonders of the kingdom of heaven on earth and in others and in yourselves. I invite you to devote yourselves to Christ and to participate in his love. And I look forward to sharing another commemoration and co-memory with you next week. 
I'll close with the prayer from our hymnal for martyrs. Gracious God, in every age you have sent men and women who have given their lives and witness to your love and truth. Inspire us with the memory of the Emmanuel Nine, whose faithfulness led to the way of the cross, and give us courage to bear full witness with our lives to your son's victory over sin and death. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for watching this, for being together. Uh, although we're apart, be safe, and we'll see you next time. Peace.